But on January the 6th, uh, on that dark day when things looked so bad in our country, I was listening to my Bible and I listened to that part of Colossians that said, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And those two words, He is. And I want you to say that with me tonight. He is. So I talked about He is the soon coming King. I talked about He is, number two, at work. I talked about that he is the, uh, listen, when things don't look good on the news, uh, he is the author and finisher of our faith. He is our provider. He is the right savior. I preach a message entitled, he is still building his church. Amen. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 117 times in the Bible. You will find the phrase, He is. So when you're going through a dark day, remember, He is. When the doctor says, I can't do anything else, remember, He is. Amen. When it looks like elections don't go like they ought to go, just remember, He is. When it seems like somebody has betrayed you and stabbed you in the back, just remember that He is. Somebody shout, He is. Give Him a hand of praise. He is the King. He is the Lord. He is the healer. And he is up to something. Somebody said Jesus is like Hallmark cards. He cares enough to send his very best. Somebody said Jesus is like Tide, the detergent Tide. He gets the stains out that others leave behind. He's like General Electric. He brings good things to life. He's like Scotch tape. You can't see him, but you know he's there. He's like Delta. He's ready when you are. He's like Allstate. You're in good hands. Amen. He's like a VO5 hairspray. He holds through all kinds of weather. He's like Dial Soap. My favorite here. Aren't you glad you have him? And don't you wish everybody else did? Amen. And then finally, as you stand tonight, he is like Coke. Aren't you glad he is the real thing? Somebody say amen tonight. And John chapter 13 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we go to the table tonight, the final message in this series, he is inviting us to his table. John chapter 13, verse 21. And when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast and said unto him, Lord, is, uh, who is it? In verse 26, Jesus said, or answer, he it is to whom I shall give a sop. And when I've dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscarot, the son of Simon. The first elements of communion were given to the one who would do him the most damage. Jesus said, love your enemies and do good to those that despitefully use you. And we're going to find out tonight that even to Judas Iscariot, Jesus was offering his very body and blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, because of communion tonight, I'm going to read this and I'll allude back to it. For I have received of the Lord that which I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took, what did he take? And when he had given what? He broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, he said, This cup is the New Testament, and my what? This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that it eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Thank you, Father, that he is, you are, inviting us to your table tonight. May we come to the table uh, and partake of the bread and the wine and the body and the blood. Uh, and may we be healed and forgiven, and we'll give you praise for it. And everybody said amen. And turn around and tell somebody, you are invited. I want you to give the Lord a hand of praise here tonight. Amen. Come on, give him a clap of praise.
on the night before the crucifixion, and we're celebrating Passion Week this week, Jesus sent out a special invitation to his disciples to spend that fateful evening at his table. Say with me, at his table. Salvation did not begin with the nails or with the scourging or even with the crucifixion. But it started, the event started at a table. And we know who was at that table. James and John and Peter and the 12 disciples and even Judas. But I want you to know something and that is this. There's someone else who's invited to that table. And you want to know who is invited also among those? You are, and I are. And he is still inviting people to that table. Will you come? What if your mother said, come, and you didn't? I mean, every now and then, mom will say, come over and have a meal. And I can say, mom, I'm busy, and I'm, I'll try to get over there. And, and then time will go by, and she'll say, well, come on over and have a meal. And I'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm getting to it. And after a while, you know, it's going to begin to be, mom's going to, her heart's going to be hurt because she wants her son at the table. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ and the Father is asking for you tonight to come to his table. First Samuel chapter 20 and 18. And Jonathan said uh, to David, tomorrow is the new moon and thou shalt be missed because your seat will be empty. If you don't come to the table, uh, you're going to be missed. Uh, and we don't want to have an empty seat uh, at the table. Now, what if the president of the United States, uh, whether it be President Trump or President Biden or President Bush or whoever, what if they were to invite you as a personal invitation to dine with them at the White House? Wouldn't that be an honor? Would you go? I think I would. I don't care who the president is, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian. Uh, if they invite me to the White House, that would be an honor. And let's say for some reason you don't go. Let's say you decline President Biden's or President Trump's invitation. Uh, let's say you decline that invitation. Do you think that affects President Biden or President Trump? Oh. He's not going to be here. He's got world, uh, a whole world at his fingertips. He's got uh, secretaries and, and cabinet officials. And he's got uh, the weight of, the, of America upon his shoulders. And if he invites you to the table uh, and you don't show up or you don't accept the invitation, he's not going to be that greatly affected. But I want you to know that's not the way it is with God. When he invites you to the table and you don't come to the table, I'm talking about tonight, Sunday night. Uh, and some people every now and then they'll say, well, I'm not going to partake of communion. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But if he invites you to that table, uh, President Trump or President Biden might not bother them, uh, but it will touch your father's heart. Uh, you will be missed. Uh, your seat will be empty. He is inviting you, you and me, little old me, nobody, me from nowhere, me. Uh, oh, but he said, I've got a seat at the table. Give him a praise tonight. He is inviting us to the table. And I'm glad about that. Amen. And he said, come to the table and don't come just once. Come often. Let me give you four things that will happen at his table. His table, point one, is a place of celebration. Somebody say celebration. Oh, I love to have a good celebration meal and somebody's birthday or anniversary. I just give me an excuse and we're going to go on up to Cracker Barrel and put those tables together. And we're going to celebrate in front of the fireplace in the winter. And we're going to celebrate in the summer. Amen. Uh, uh, but his table is a place of celebration. We celebrate his life. We celebrate his death. Uh, we celebrate healing. We celebrate the forgiveness of sins. Uh, we celebrate the provision, the invitation. Uh, and notice uh, when they asked who it was that would to betray him. Look at uh, John 13 and 26. Uh, look at this. Uh, uh, when they said, who's going to betray you, Jesus? He said, somebody's going to betray me right here at this table. They said, who's going to betray you? And Jesus said, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. Let me tell you something. This is the first communion table. 
And he invited all those disciples. And he invited Judas knowing Judas was going to betray him. And the very first person served was Judas himself. And I could say, and I'm, I can see the word picture here. And Jesus puts that bread and that wine. And he holds his hand out to Judas. And he said, you're first, buddy. I'm going to let you understand that everything you need is from this piece of bread. Everything you need. You got 30 little old pieces of silver. And they're not going to last you very long on the day of wrath. Uh, you've got prestige or you've got uh, an agenda. But if you'll just focus uh, on what is right here in front of you, uh, grace uh, and mercy. You don't have to do this, Judas. Uh, you don't have to go to hell. Uh, you don't have to hang yourself. Uh, i am invited you to the table because I love you uh, and you don't have to do it. Uh, and here's my everything we need uh, is in that hand, that nail scarred, stretched out hand. Uh, all of fulfillment fulfillment. Uh, drugs can't do it. Uh, money can't do it. Relationships can't do it. Uh, but we can celebrate uh, that all that we need uh, is from that stretched out hand. And if he'll give it to Judas, I know he'll give it to you and me. Can you say amen? Give him praise for that tonight. Hallelujah. You see, Judas declined the bread. He didn't take it. Oh, now I'll tell you something. Salvation starts with God, not with us. Salvation was when he stretched out his hand and offering that bread. First John 4, 19 says, we love him because what he first, that's what we're celebrating. Oh, listen, a little girl when Sunday school got this wrong. Uh, she said, we hugged him because he first hugged us. Well, that's not too wrong, is it? Oh, thank the Lord that that we he loved us and he provided for us and he has invited us and we are to celebrate at his table being invited to a table with more honor than the White House. I'm seated with the king of glory and I'm celebrating pardon and mercy and forgiveness. He hugged me first and I'm going to hug him back. Can you say amen? Number two, his table's a place of contemplation. Because notice it says, this do in what? Remembrance of me. Have you ever forgot your wife's birthday, guys? I forgot it one time. Well, let me tell you this little story. Sister Darnell might get on me afterwards. But I, I, her birthday was on a certain year and a certain day. And it was about four o'clock in the afternoon before I finally said happy birthday. I knew it was her birthday, but I got busy. We got out of bed. We took our showers, went our ways. And later that evening, I said, oh, honey, happy birthday. Well, something will not quite right. Then I got to the, to the meat of it sometime later. But she, she wanted me to wish her happy birthday as soon as we got up. Amen. So the night before her birthday, about 11.59 p.m., <laughs> I'm right ready. When the clock strikes 12, I'm going to say, happy birthday, darling. And I might need a ride home tonight. Amen. But I'm just telling you, <laughs> I live over in Elm City. I just want you to know. But, uh, and, and there's a doghouse out there just in case. But I just want you to know that, that you know, we tend to forget things. Amen. We do. We tend to forget. Uh, I'm, I'm not as good on people's names. Uh, I, heard, I understand that goldfish, anybody got goldfish or had goldfish? Uh, they have, uh, scientists, I don't know how to figure this out, but they have a three-second memory. And that's it. Three seconds. And you know, you talk to some Christians, and I believe they've got a three-second memory too. God will bless in a service like this, and then the next morning, they've got the weight of the world on their shoulders about to commit suicide. Didn't you remember what God did for you last night? We need to contemplate. We need to celebrate. We need to call to remembrance as the writer of Lamentations. When I call to, I remember. I'll tell you, sometimes when fear comes in, when doubts come in, when people do things that hurt me, and I just get all in, I'm, you know, tied up and, and knots, and all of a sudden I say, hold it. Time out, as Pastor Jerry says. Time out. I begin to call to remembrance the things he spoke to me in this altar. I begin to call to remembrance uh, those good prophecies he's 
Spirit over me. I begin to call to remembrance His faithfulness, uh, how He saved me, sanctified me, filled me with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and when I call to remembrance some of the testimonies you have given, uh, and that's what communion is all about, making sure that we don't forget uh, there was a high price paid for the low sins of this world, uh, but He stepped out of earth to heaven, uh, 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 out of heaven to earth, uh, so that we could go from earth to heaven, uh, and God help us never to forget it. Can you say amen? And I love telling this story, and it's one of the stories I'll tell over the years about Stephen Alford, who was a, is a great Bible preacher, and he, his parents were missionaries, and, and they had left him at home. He was just a young man, and in Africa, uh, a, a, um, an animal jumped through uh, the window, a leopard jumped through the window, and he was just there by himself. His parents were not there. It was just him and the dog. And that leopard, according to his testimony, began to, you know, go back and forth and, and begin to get ready to pounce him. And just as that leopard jumped to go to Stephen to kill him, the dog intercepted the leopard. And so the leopard wound up getting the dog first. And it gave him a chance to escape. And as he was escaping, he heard the cries of the dog. And he said, for all of my life, I'll never forget what that dog did for me. And oh, God, that's a, that's a touching story. But don't ever forget the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. God forget, for, forbid that we forget Calvary. That we forget the blood. That we forget the nails in his head. That we forget the stripes on his backs. That we forget the passion. This is Passion Week. We need to celebrate and contemplate. Our salvation was paid at a great price. Let's not neglect such a great salvation. Let's get on fire for God. Let's be not cold or lukewarm. Let's not forget. Let's come to the table and remember one more time the blood. And he took the old leopard and the lion of Satan. And thank God he saved me with his own life. Can you give him a hand of praise tonight for it? Do you remember? And then his table should be a place of consecration. Somebody say consecration. Because it does say, let a man examine himself. This is time to take inventory. Uh, hey, I'm coming to his table and, and, and I'm going to uh, talk about what does it mean to come unworthily? Um, you know, I did graduate from East Carolina University. Sister Judy Meeks was a college graduate from East Carolina University. She was an educator, and, um, and she was uh, very learned in, in the English. And the unworthily is an adverb. An adverb answers how, when, where, why, and to what extent. It is not an adjective. An adjective describes maybe a person, place, or thing. Uh, but unworthily uh, uh, means that you are doing something in an improper way. You're doing it unworthily of what the way intends for you to do. But to be unworthy is, a, is an adjective. It describes that you are X, Y, Z, that you are unworthy. You personally are unworthy. You have done something, said something, therefore you are unworthy. The Bible does not say that, we're, that when we come to the table that we should come unworthy. It says don't come unworthily. You see, we flipped it around. So like the gates of hell shall not prevail. We think uh, that we're standing back and the gates of hell are coming to us uh, and it shall not prevail. But no, 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 no. It's not that. It's that we're marching on the gates of hell and they're not going to prevail against the church. They can't hold us back. Same thing with unworthily. You see, do not come to the communion table uh, and, and, and low shot what is happening. Uh, you need to come with expectation. You need to come examining your life, uh, realizing that you cannot come worthy on your own. Listen, we're all not worthy of our own, but he has made us worthy because of the blood of the lamb. We, we must not, the book of Acts says, you've deemed yourself unworthy of the grace of God and we better not do that. He died for your sins. He died for your messes. He died for your rebellion. He died and we, we that's the very ones look, if he let Judas Iscariot come, he'll let you come. Come on, give him a hand of praise here tonight. Amen. But examine yourself. And there was, there was a time when I, when, man, 
I, I said, well, I really struggled last week with sinful thoughts and things. You know how young boys are, young men, and, and we live in a world of temptation. And, and uh, every time you turn on the TV, there's a bikinis and clad women and, and uh, billboard. This is when I was a teenager, and, and uh, the, they would offer communion. And I'm like, I can't take communion because I've really struggled with that uh, this week. And so I wouldn't take communion. And, and then I realized, wait a minute. I'm struggling with it. That means I don't like it. That means it bothers me. So that means I missed it. <laughs> you, that's when you do come to the communion table. You bring your struggles. Now, you don't come up to the communion table. I'm going to say this now on the flip side. Don't come up to the communion table shacking up. Knowing you are living in sin. Knowing, now, I'm not saying you're struggling. I'm not saying that you have, have had a temptation and you fail. I'm talking about you're in willful sin. You are doing something, breaking the commandments of God that you know and you can stop it, but you don't want to stop it because you like your sin. Then you come to the communion table, you're in big trouble because you, you've messed up. <laughs> you're, you're almost, in a way, uh, making light of the suffering he did. Folks, sin. Pays so carries with it a price. Uh, you laying around, sleeping around, and knowingly doing it, uh, and willfully doing it over and over again, living together, knowing you're not married. All of this stuff here, knowing that is wrong, uh, and 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 yet you just still come to the communion table. No, repent. Uh, say, God, forgive me. I'm not going to go back into that relationship. Help me to break it off. Help me to make it right. Uh, then you can come, Amen. Uh, and God will do a work. Y'all getting quiet. Hey, folks, let's consecrate. Amen? Consecrate. Amen? Consecrate. Doesn't mean perfect. Nobody is perfect to come to the table. But you come to the table, he makes us perfect. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Research has revealed the benefits of drinking grape juice. There's a compound in grapes called, and I'm not going to call it, quercetin, that has been found to have preventative agents against cataracts. Has anybody ever dealt with cataracts? Well, they say that this quercetin will help keep your lenses on your eye clear through the, through the grape juice, through natural grape juice, not the sugared down powdered version that you get at Food Line on the fourth, fourth aisle with all the other sugar stuff. The sugar just makes that, you know, uh, nulls that. But... True grapes, eating grapes and grape juice that's, that's organic has that ability to help your eyes stay clear and not to form cataracts. And brother and sister, I believe it's the same way when we come to the communion table. When we come often and regularly, it just keeps our eyes clear, spiritually speaking. Keeps our eyes focused, not upon what somebody said to me or somebody's done to me or what the news channel says. But folks, we need to ever more in this day keep our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And another thing is we need to be keeping our eyes clear because he's soon to return. <laughs> He may come in this communion service tonight, and I want to be at his table. Amen. He's invited me to his table. His table is a place of celebration, contemplation, consecration, and finally, it's a place of continuation. Jesus said, keep on doing this. Now, there's been debate over how often we should do it. Um, the, the mainline churches would do it every Sunday. Um, they would do the, the communion. Um, so how often should we do it? Every day, every month, every, every week, whatever. It's very interesting that the Bible never tells you exactly how often to do it. So it leaves room there. The main thing is you don't want to do it so much that it loses its power. But neither do you want to put it off so much that you forget. I think we do it about once a quarter or twice a year, at least around Christmas and Easter, we'll do it. Um, some churches don't do it at all, but I believe the scripture is very plain. We need to continue the practice of coming to his table. I promise you, if President Biden asked you to come, you wouldn't hesitate. If President Trump if asked you to come, you wouldn't have hesitated. You would go. And I know some of you didn't vote for Trump. I know some of you didn't vote for Biden. But if, brother, if, you, if you didn't vote for Biden and he invited you to the table, just look at it as an opportunity to win a soul. Amen. <laughs> Amen, somebody. <laughs>
And Daniel was uh, 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 a uh, minister to those kings and man, had a tremendous impact. But I close tonight, and Brother Quentin, if you'll come, say the word Mephibosheth. Now, say, I am Mephibosheth. Say that. You say, Brother Ricky, what in the world? You must be drinking that wine that's been messed up over there. So. And by the way, just for the record, we do not have alcoholic wine when we have communion. Terry Trammell, one of our theologians, has written an article, and he can, you can read it, but the wine that Jesus turned to water to wine was not alcoholic, and he gives all the reasons why. And that's, that's, a, that's a, something we don't debate here. It is non-fermented grape juice. But Mephibosheth, he was, and I'll let you know when to start, Brother, uh, brother um, Quentin. So when King Saul lost out with God and he persecuted David, God had called David to be king. In those days, when a, a king took over, he was to kill the rival king's family. So all of King Saul's children and grandchildren, anybody related to him down his direct descendants, it was just common that they would be killed. Well, when King David got to the throne, he found a descendant of his rival, King Saul, who actually was King Saul's grandson. And it's a long story, and I'm going to just condense it down into about three or four minutes here. But King David had a relationship with King Saul's son, Jonathan. And Jonathan died, but left a son named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was a cripple. He was, he was hurt. He was actually, he had a nurse that dropped him on the floor. Now, wouldn't you, have, wouldn't you like to have somebody babysitting your child and you come home from work and they dropped them and made them lame in their feet? Wouldn't that be pretty tough to deal with that? Well, that's what, what happened. He was dropped by accident, but he was dropped by his nurse. And he was lame in his feet. And so when King David came to the throne, King David said, find me Mephibosheth. Put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes. You think this is it. I can't run because I've been dropped. And the king has summons me and I can't escape. And I'm a descendant of his rival. He's going to put me to death. And sure enough, he came before King David. Instead of King David offering him a sword, let me tell you what King David offered him. An invitation to his table. He said, Mephibosheth, fear not. Somebody say, fear not. <laughs> I know you've been dropped. <laughs> Some of you have been dropped. Some of you have been hurt. Some of you people have done things to you. Maybe we had a lady that testified uh, 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 that, that she was abused as a child from the very people that should have. She was dropped uh, in spiritually sense. Uh, but don't, let me tell you, uh, you may be a lame and a cripple. You may have the death sentence on you because all are under condemnation. But King David said, there will never be a meal served in this palace, uh, Mephibosheth, where you are not invited. Uh, and I can just see uh, when it's meal time at King King David's residence and here comes Absalom with his beautiful locks flowing and he sits down at his daddy's table and I can see Amnon and, and Adonijah and I can see the beautiful Tamar who took the, the, just David's great children he had a bunch of children I'm just naming a few and then there's wise Solomon with his spectacles on coming out from the study and he is seated at the table but food cannot be served and, and the king himself arrives he said we were missing somebody and down the hall is a clump and a clump and a clump and there he comes and now Mephibosheth the one who was an enemy the one who had no feet no grace the one who was under death condemnation now sits at the table and the king says pass him some bread and pass him some wine and let's celebrate I am Mephibosheth give him a praise here tonight He's inviting you uh, to his table. Would you stand with us tonight? Just play anything that's on your heart. And I'm going to ask the ushers, if you would, to come and bring the elements of communion before us tonight. Amen. The Lord is good. Amen. Can you just praise him and thank him that you are Mephibosheth? That you are Mephibosheth? Oh, praise your name. Praise your name. Just pass those elements and take those, if you will. It was the blood. I know it was the blood. Oh, just for me. One day when I was lost. Oh, 
Jesus died upon that cross. I know it was the blood for me. I know it was. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. It was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. Oh, my Jesus, Jesus died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. Come on, sing it one more time. I know. I know it was the blood. He is. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. He's got one. He's got for one. Me. He's got one. One day when I was the oh he died Jesus died on the cross I know he was the blood for me thank God for the blood amen you hold in your hands tonight the elements of the communion now, I'm trying to get the, the bread off here so give me one second here oh have you already got it for me can we just trade all right thank you brother Doing it with a microphone in front of 50 people is a little intimidating. If you'll take out the bread here. Pastor, I want you to please join me on the stage. Brother Philip, if you'll join me as well. Pastor Nate, I want you to join me as well. Hold the bread up. Pastor Nate, after I, we partake the bread, I want you to offer a prayer and thanksgiving for the, for, the, for the body of the Lord. With his stripes, you were healed. Father, we, you have invited us to the table and we receive the bread. Now take. Dear Lord God, we thank you for allowing us just to come into your presence, Lord and partake in this precious ceremony that reminds us of the sacrifice that you made for us, Lord. Yes. As we get to experience the same thing the disciples experienced as they spent the final moments with I'm healed, God. Lord. As we understand, as we take this bread Eat up a that you a sacrificed your body <laughs> so that we could become one with you and get to live eternally with you, Lord God. Now we become heirs to the throne in the same way that you are, Lord Jesus. You loved us so much that you wanted us to have everything that you had within us, Lord God. And we thank you for just laying your life on the line, Lord God, and taking the beating that none of us could ever bear, Lord God. And we understand the meaning and the purpose of it all, Lord. And the significance cannot be overstated, Lord. Yes. So we thank you for all of yes. that, Jesus, and continue to hold us with your body until we get to be with you again. Now hold the blood. The wine that represents the blood. And after we partake of this, uh, Brother Philip, if you'll say a prayer of thanksgiving, the blood will never lose its power. Don't forget what Jesus did for you in shedding the blood for your sins and for your healing. Take and partake of that blood right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you today for the precious blood of Jesus. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, because we, we have experienced the power in the blood. Yes. Lord, we know that this blood cleanses yes. from all sin. Yes. There's more power in one drop yes. of that precious blood Glory. than all of the filth of all of the sin of all of mankind from Adam and Eve to the end of time. We thank you for that mm. blood. Yes. Lord, it's you imparted to us your righteousness through that blood, and we thank you for it. We thank you for your willingness to suffer that we might be redeemed. In Jesus' name. 
Somebody say, He is. He is, he is my healer. He is my king. He is my savior. He's my sanctifier. He fills me with the Holy Ghost. He's coming again. He is the Lord. He is risen. Give him a hand of praise here tonight. Amen. I know it was the blood. Sing that again, brother. I know. it was the blood. Come on, sing it. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. Hallelujah. One day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. I know it was the blood for me. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word for me. One day when I was on, Jesus died on the cross. I know it was the blood for me. They nailed him to the tree. They nailed him to the tree. They nailed him to the tree for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. They nailed him to the tree for 